I encourage you to take out your Bible and also your outline as we go through this five-week series, The Creeds of Christmas. And what is a creed as we begin this study? Well, a creed is something in the Latin, it means I believe, I trust. That's what it means, I believe, I trust. And um, as we think about that, there's a lot of creeds throughout the Bible. The, the, the new, the, I should say the newest one or the one that was the newest to the uh, disciples was in 1 Corinthians 15. Within hours, one of my professors believe that they were already reciting the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. We're going to look at the various creeds, which are doctrines, which are teachings, which are principles woven through the Christmas story as we go through the next five weeks. And just remember, Christmas is on a Sunday this year, so we got five weeks technically we're going to include as Advent. So first, so look over at Luke chapter 1. And what I really want you to get this series, through this series is for you to apply these things to your life, how it fits with your everyday life and in this culture. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 and we'll look at snippets throughout this season of different aspects of the Christmas story. And we'll begin here in Luke 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. Let's commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray that you will just uh, take these words that I will share today and from the scriptures, Lord, that you will help it to apply to our lives and our hearts today. Lord, these are not my words. I pray you would speak through me. Your Holy Spirit would have its intended purpose in each and every heart and life as these words go out and that you will uh, change us, transform us, encourage us, convict us, challenge us, however you decide to work in our hearts and lives. Help us to be open to your word. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, our first creed we want to look at and apply today is that God the Father is the promise keeper. He is the promise keeper. Prophecies that are fulfilled, and we'll speak specifically of the Christmas season. Now, what is a prophecy? Well, prophecy is a message from God. GotQuestions.org says, although foretelling is often associated with prophecy, revealing the future is not a necessary element of prophecy. However, since only God knows the future, any authoritative word about the future must of necessity be a prophecy. That is, a message from God. That's what a prophecy is in the purest form, a message from God. This is God's way of making a prediction of something that's going to happen in the future and then seeing it fulfilled in this instance in the Christmas story. The amazing thing is that what God predicted through his prophets many years ago were fulfilled down to the smallest detail. God's word can be trusted and God means what he says when he predicts the future. The first prophecy we'll talk about is that Jesus would be born of a woman, born of a woman. We see that all the way back in Genesis 3.15. God said, I will put hatred or enmity between you, speaking of Satan who had inhabited the serpent. I will put hatred between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, Christ, will bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. This verse is commonly called the prot evangelium. Evangelium. This is a compound of two Greek words, protos, meaning first, and evangelion, meaning good news or gospel. Thus, the verse is commonly referred to, referred to as the first mention in the Bible of the good news of salvation. God said in his word at the beginning there in Genesis 3, there'll be a perpetual struggle between satanic forces and mankind. 
The hatred between the woman Eve who gave birth to Cain. Eve also gave birth to all of mankind, and eventually a woman named Mary, a virgin, would give birth to Jesus Christ. Jesus will crush Satan by rising from the dead, while Satan will bruise the heel of Jesus by his crucifixion and death. Some believe in Genesis 3.15, this teaches that Satan would cripple mankind, those made in the image of God. Satan's offspring are spiritual, not physical. They're fallen angels, they're demons, and anyone serving in his kingdom of darkness on behalf of the Father, who is the devil. And Jesus identified who those people were, if you are not following God, you're following Satan. It says in John 8, 44, Jesus speaking to the religious leaders, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and father of lies. So Genesis three fifteen is a verse pointing to Christ coming to earth as a sinless man and the son of God to be the payment for the world's sin by his death. In Galatians 4, Paul describes the fulfillment of this prophecy. Galatians 4, 4, when in the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. Think about that. Of all times in history, God decided for that specific moment for Jesus to leave the very throne room of heaven, wrap himself up in human flesh and be born in a manger like we have behind me up here in the baptistry. Now think about that. That's an amazing, amazing thought. Second of all, we see he was born of a virgin, not just of a woman, but born of a virgin. In Isaiah 7, 14, he said, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, the Hebrew word virgin in this verse could be translated as young maiden or virgin, depending on the context. And the context here strongly supports that virgin is the correct translation in our English Bibles. But this is confirmed by Matthew and an angel that spoke to Joseph in a dream as Joseph contemplated divorcing Mary quietly. In Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 1, it says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The angel quotes from Isaiah 7.14 confirming the translation we have in Isaiah 7, 14. There, virgin in the Greek means unmarried daughter of virgin. And you see how God is faithful to fulfill his promise in time and how he works through history to bring about his plan. Thirdly, we see he was born in Bethlehem. And we're just looking at just scratching the surface of some of these prophecies that go with the Christmas story. Born in Bethlehem, you're probably very familiar with this verse. Notice the prophecy that we've heard many times made by the prophet Micah. In Micah 5.2, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Then this is fulfilled in Matthew 2. In Matthew 2, 1, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, and behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, jump down to verse 4, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, Herod inquired of them where the Christ was to be born, and they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I may come and worship him. That I may come and worship him. Of course, we know that wasn't his motive at all. 
You think about God, he's the ultimate promise keeper. Back in the 90s, Bill McCartney and a group of men started what was known as the Promise Keeper Movement. And I remember going to Indianapolis for one of these events, and after that, many more. But 63,000 men gathered in this domed arena, and they were singing the hymns, the praises to God. It was bone-chilling to experience that. And part of that Promise Keeper movement was for them, to the men, to make seven promises. And they included relationships with God that they would make promises to, with their fellow man, with their spouse, and with the local church. And these men were committed to doing these things at that time. And some of the men in our church would probably uh, have gone to some of those events as well. But think about God. Every promise he makes, he keeps. God's the ultimate promise keeper. And what he says has and will continue to happen. You can put your faith on the rock solid promises of God's word. In Joshua 21, verse 45, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Think about that. All that they had been through. God had taken them through the wilderness into the promised land. At the end of Joshua's life, he said, all the promises of God's word to this point have come to pass. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. God keeps his promises, wants to answer the promises that we claim when we pray to him. When you have to give a presentation the next day at your job and you're nervous, we can take God at his word not to fear. He hasn't given us the spirit of fear. When the future is uncertain, trust that God has your future in mind and has your best interests in mind as you go through that time of uncertainty. Can you take God at his word? This is a wonderful gift at this Christmas season as we think about him being the ultimate promise keeper. Here's the application. We can live in confidence by taking God at his word. I encourage you this Christmas season as you think through the story and think through the amazing things that occurred. Think about what God wants to do in your life and what promises that you can claim at this time, whatever you're experiencing in your life. Let's look at another doctrinal teaching to apply to our lives this Christmas season. The miracle worker. Miracles occur at Christmas. Miracles occur at Christmas. This is uh, one of the best places in the Bible to talk about numerous miracles coming together. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? How am I to give birth to this son, this Emmanuel, this king of the Jews, when I have not known a man? That's a good question to ask. And Mary was just an ordinary teenage girl who is faithfully following the Lord. The angel comes to her and interrupts her ordinary life to give her extraordinary news. And God often uses the ordinary and he puts the extra on the ordinary in our lives. If we're open to him working. He uses the ordinary things for his honor, for his use, and for his glory. In Luke 1.35, and the angel answered her that question, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child is to be born, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, <clears throat> if you look through church history and you think about uh, the popes over the years and some of the decrees that they've made about Mary that we wouldn't agree with, Some of the popes have said she is equal to God or Jesus. We don't agree with that. That she was without sin. We disagree with that. That she was a perpetual virgin because the Bible records that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Mary had kids with Joseph and James, a writer in the Bible, is one of their children and was Jesus' half-brother, for example. Mary was much like you and I. She was an ordinary person living her life for the Lord. Look at what she says in Luke 138. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. 
Notice the word Mary uses to describe herself. Servant, a female slave, involuntary or voluntary, a handmaiden. We see also that God makes the impossible possible. God makes the impossible possible. In Luke 1.37, he says, For nothing will be impossible with God. In Genesis 18.14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And you remember that story. Abraham and Sarah were promised to Isaac, and they were beyond the years of able to have children. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and God said, is anything too hard for the Lord? In John 14, 14, Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. God specializes in the supernatural, and that's why so many people attack the miracles found in the Bible. The miracles of the Bible can be explained away, they said, as we learn more and more about science. And if you can explain away the miracles, then you've taken away the inspiration of Scripture and so many other things. David Hume, who was a British philosopher, didn't believe in miracles. He attacked those who believed in them. David Hume said, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. And as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, which I would say, who is the one who established those laws? <clears throat> the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. In other words, miracles can't happen by definition. Of course, this argument ignores the fact that no one nor everyone put together has witnessed every event that ever took place and so could not possibly know whether the laws of nature have been suspended or violated in some way for a miracle to occur. Hume's second argument is that miracles have not, in fact, ever happened. And he argued that uh, testimony of people uh, was an adequate witness of the fact that those things occurred. But how do you explain that 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus at one time? So the fact that Jewish and Christian history fits with the history of the world and that there were eyewitness accounts recorded of miracles in the Bible shows evidence that miracles happened. Eric Metaskis in his book of miracles said this, part of the miracle of the resurrection is that it had so empowered a ragtag band of fishermen and tax collectors that they were emboldened to stand against all earthly authority and power and ultimately would upend the once inviolable order of the mighty Roman Empire. History tells us this, this happened. So what better explanation can be offered for how it happened? Unless we miss something, there exists none. And if there exists none, we are invited to submit to the logic of what we know now, that the most celebrated and most scorned miracle of miracles actually happened. And perhaps most miraculously of all, can even be understood to have happened because of historical evidence. Do you realize that historians who are not believers have come together and they agree on 10 evidences of the resurrection of Christ? And then God takes on human flesh to save sinners. God takes on human flesh to save sinners. Make no mistake as to why Jesus came. He didn't just come to do signs and wonders. He didn't come just to heal people. He didn't come to do miracles. He came to serve, and those are his own words, and not to be served. It wasn't an accident that he was crucified. It was all part of God's divine plan for redemption. He did not come to become a martyr. He came with one purpose in mind, to pay for the sins of the world so mankind would have a way to salvation, to fellowship with God through Christ, and have a place in heaven. You see, when he was born and placed in that manger. The shadow of the cross was on that manger. He knew what his final destiny was going to be, and that was his purpose. In Matthew 1.21, the angel said, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, his name literally means Jehovah saves, or Jehovah is salvation. Jesus' purpose for coming was to save mankind from their sins and to have a relationship with the one who created them. And his reason for doing that was to be rightly related to God in this life, 
to have the assurance of abundant life here on this planet. We focus so many times on eternity in heaven, and we should. But he also leaves us here to honor and glorify him and enjoy his creation and the pleasures that he's given us to have abundant life, to have the peace that passes understanding, to know why God created us, to understand that we have a purpose and that our purpose is unique and he's given us spiritual, spe- special gifts and abilities and spiritual gifts unlike anyone else. So this Christmas season, don't miss the reason for the season. God's son came down in the form of a baby and God sent Jesus to us wrapped in humanity so that we could be saved. Jesus said the only way to the Father and to heaven is through him. Don't forget that. In John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God is a miracle-working God, and the greatest miracle he does continually is to bring people into his kingdom to transform them and to save us day by day to make us into his image. In John chapter 1, 11 through 13, in Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, the message, he said he came to his own people, Jesus did, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, who believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God's selves. These are the God begotten, not blood begotten, not flesh begotten, not sex begotten. Begotten by the will of God if we believe we are his sons and daughters. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore is anyone who is in Christ as a new creation. The old has passed away. The verb there is in the past. It's past action. The death on the cross by Jesus and us dying with him. Our sins are dead. And behold, the new has come. The new nature is transforming us in our old nature, our sin is dropping away. And so God wants us to do extraordinary things in our life if we will just trust him and ask. He may not do it in the way that we think. It may not be in our time, but he chooses when he wants to do a miracle in our life if we will trust him. God wants to do amazing things. So what can you point to today as something miraculous in your life or something you're trusting God to do that would Truly be a miracle. Trust him. Give praise to God that he will do what he promises in his word. The application here is that we can trust God by faith to do the extraordinary in our lives. What is it you're trusting him to do that's extraordinary? That if he did it, it would be considered a miracle in your life. I hope you have some of those prayer requests as you think about what God is doing in your life. Our last creed to apply to our lives today in God's the Father is this, the revealer of truth. In the plan and preparation of Father, he tells us he's a promise keeper. He tells us he's a miracle worker, but also in this Christmas story, he talks about being the revealer of truth, revealing the Son of God at Christmas. It tells us the Son became flesh. In John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Logos, Jesus Christ, and the Word, Logos, Jesus, was with God, and the Word was God. I like Eugene Peterson's phrases of John 1.14, how he says this, the Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory like Father, like Son, generous inside and out and true from start to finish. He came and lived among the people. He walked among them. He was tempted in all points like we would be, but yet was without sin. What an amazing, amazing thing. The incarnation. This is the most prominent teaching that comes out of the Christmas story. Incarnation means literally enfleshment, the act of being made flesh. And because of the relevance to this holiday, it's really called the doctrine of Christmas. It's the most important doctrine that we could look at as we think about the different creeds through the Christmas story. Rick Freeman, in an email I got this week from the Chosen People Ministry, said this, the miracle of the incarnation means God not only created us in his image, tabernacled among us in the wilderness and gave us the scriptures, but he also sanctified earthly flesh by humbling himself to become one of us. He redeemed our bodily experience and our spiritual life from the power of sin in the grave. 
The baby of Bethlehem transforms everything. Emmanuel, God with us. He's with us wherever we go in life. If you know Christ as Savior and the Holy Spirit is inhabiting your body, that he is always with you 24-7. He experiences what you experience. You carry him with him, with him where you carry him with you wherever you go. And in the wilderness as well, we think about how God wanted to be with man in the wilderness as he was the pillar of fire and the cloud as well. We think of in the garden, how he talked with Adam and Eve. In the two temples, the one that was created first by Solomon and then rebuilt, his Shekinah glory came down and he dwelt with his people. In Jesus Christ, obviously, as we think about him being wrapped in human flesh and walking among us, and in the form of the Holy Spirit living within us. And one day, he will, as we read in Revelation, he will come down with his new Jerusalem and the new heaven and new earth, and he will set up his rule and reign, and he will physically be with his people forever. One of the things that makes Christianity unique is how our God is so personal and desires to be with his people, those who love and serve him. God is a relational God. He wants our attention and our focus on him. He wants us to be in continual communication with him about our life. He cares about the smallest details that's going on. And so take time to share, to converse, and to talk with our Heavenly Father. Well, we see also the Son was given to us, an act of grace. Given, Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The grace of God gave us a son who's described here with four character qualities. Wonderful Counselor, someone who's exceptional, a distinguished counselor who gives great wisdom and guidance. Mighty God, who's all-powerful to save. Everlasting Father, Jesus, was eternal because he had the same essence as God. And he had the ability to know the beginning from the end because he's eternal. And Prince of Peace, when he returns a second time, he will rule and reign on earth forever in righteousness. And then the son was giving gifts, pointing to his royalty. Pointing to his royalty. As we look at this last point today, In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And in verse 11 of the same chapter, And going into the house, the wise men saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These gifts were given to him to reveal who Jesus was and who he would be as he grew up. The gold, as you know, points to Jesus' royalty. He would be called the king of the Jews at his crucifixion. The frankincense points to his divinity revealed on earth, that he was the son of God. And the myrrh reveals that he was the son of man, his humanity. Myrrh also represented death because it was used as an embalming fluid to bury a dead body. Jesus would die to pay for the sins of the world. So how do these teachings apply to our life today? Well, first of all, he wants, us, he wants to live in us and with us throughout our lives. And he does that in the form of the Holy Spirit. And we learn more about him through the word of God and through prayer. He's our example. He said we're to deny ourselves, to take up the cross and to follow him. One of the things we see in John 1.14 that he had a balance of grace and truth. So how can we be like Jesus? Well, we balance and we walk that tightrope sometimes, that tension of showing grace with truth to serve others rather than to be served, to be loving, to be kind, to be compassionate, to see the needs of others and attempt to meet those needs. Jesus identified with us, as I said, in human form, by being tempted in all points, it says in Hebrews 4, and yet was without sin. And so he reveals himself so we can know him and know about him to walk in relationship with him. So our application is this, as we seek the Lord and his truth, 
He will reveal his will in our lives as we walk in his spirit. Can you say you not only understand these truths, but they're at work in your life, that they're activated, that you're following through with these things that you know? I think sometimes we take the Holy Spirit for granted. We take the word of God for granted. We heard about those churches in Africa and how they gather together and many of them don't have a copy of God's word. They have an audio Bible and that is what they rely upon. We have these resources at our hands at all times. So I hope that as we think about these things, we're applying these truths to our life. C.S. Lewis said it well, the son of God became a man that men might become sons of God. Our key thought here is God sent his son to earth as he promised to reveal himself and bring us the miracle of salvation at Christmas. Promised, revealed, and the miracle of salvation at Christmas. I hope that you ponder these things this week and think about them and think about how to live these out and to share these truths with other people at this important season of life. What questions to ponder this week? Are you able to stand on God's word and claim it faithfully for your life? What are you trusting God to do right now that would be extraordinary if he did it? Is there something that you're praying and asking God to do and it would be a miracle? Keep praying, keep trusting, keep asking, keep being patient. And are you confidently seeking and walking in God's will? I hope you'll consider Christmas again when Pope Julius I authorized December 25th to be celebrated as the birth of Jesus in 353 AD. Who would have ever thought that it would become what it is today? When Professor Charles Follin lit candles on the first Christmas tree in America in 1832, who would have ever thought that the decorations would become as elaborate as they are today? Well, it's a long time since 1832, longer still from 353 AD and longer still from the dark night that brightened by a special star which Jesus uh, had happened to him when he was born. Yet as we approach December 25th again, it gives us yet another opportunity to pause in the midst of excitement and elaborate decorations and expensive commercialization of Christmas which surrounded Christmas today to consider again the event of Christmas and the person whose birth that we celebrate. Let's bow for prayer. <clears throat> Father, as we enter in to this Advent season, as we take each Sunday and we think about different creeds and teachings, Lord, the goal here is to internalize them, is to ponder them, is to think about them, and then to see how they apply to our hearts and lives. And Lord, even beyond that, there's many, many people out there that don't know what the true meaning of Christmas is all about from a biblical perspective. They've heard stories and traditions and renditions of, of songs and, and uh, ideas of what the story may be from a human perspective. But Lord, give us the opportunity uh, to share with people who may have open hearts more, more open than any other time of the year to share with them uh, what the truths are and the miracle that occurred at Christmas that we could have eternal life because Jesus came to save us from our sins. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.